We are preparing to stream to stream a lecture. Poi mi mandi una lettera di invito? Scusa? Poi mi mandi la lettera di invito, così... Ah, yes, yes, yes. Me la metto nel CV. Yes, because it seems there is some problem here. <coughs> Sorry, I have to restart the streaming because there, uh, there is some problem. I was just commenting that uh, Zoom works very well. Okay, welcome uh, everybody to um, the sixth lecture of uh, VC uh, Shanghai Lectures Edition. Today, as you know, we are going to uh, recover from last, last week. So today I will work uh, very little because we have uh, two uh, distinguished uh, guest lecturers. Uh, Elena Cuoco from, uh, actually from EI in Pisa, from the Ego Virgo collaboration uh, and uh, the Scuola Normale Superiore. Actually, Ego Virgo is the European counterpart of LIGO, uh, so the organization which uh, cooperated with the first ever detection of gravitational waves. And um, the second speaker will be Joanna Bryson from the University of Bath and, uh, and Princeton uh, University in the, in the US. <laughs> Uh, we will talk uh, um, on another interesting uh, topic. Actually, the impact, uh, so she will give us a survey of AI, state, state of the art, and uh, about, she will talk about the implication from the economic standpoint. While Elena, who is going to talk uh, in a few minutes, will uh, um, explain us how actually uh, artificial intelligence, and in particular machine learning, can uh, definitely help uh, in, in the quest uh, for gravitational uh, um, waves. So, Elena, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, good morning, everyone, or good evening, everyone. So, uh, I want to uh, talk a bit uh, in, in, of the application of the artificial intelligence in our field if it works. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so first of all, uh, what are gravitational waves? Uh, gravitational waves, oh, there is no, okay. Uh, gravitational waves uh, were predicted in general relativity uh, from Einstein, uh, where he said that the matrix of space-time is linked to the content of energy and mass in the space. So each time that a mass is present in a space, it deforms the matrix. 
And if this mass uh, uh, accelerates or is deformed, uh, not spherical, and the move acceler accelerates, it can produce uh, gravitational waves that are small ripples in space time that uh, can propagate through all the universe. In uh, which way we detect uh, these uh, gravitational waves? Uh, the idea is uh, to uh, reveal the effect that these uh, gravitational uh, waves can have on a suspended mass that we can consider as a free falling mass. Uh, we built, uh, we, when I say be, uh, we, I meant uh, uh, Virgo and LIGO experiment, uh, we, we built this big interferometer. Uh, that uh, can uh, uh, measure the distance, uh, the variation of distance uh, that uh, can be caused by the presence of uh, gravitational waves. Each time a uh, gravitational waves hit this interferometer, there will be this uh, uh, change of the position of this suspended mirror, and we can uh, uh, detect any variation of this distance on a photo detector. So, we will uh, detect uh, this uh, gravitational uh, signal as a uh, change in, uh, in, the, the, um, in the light that we can uh, detect on this photo detector. The uh, amplitude of this kind of uh, signal is very, very, very low. We uh, need to uh, measure the distance, that, uh, the variation of this is, it is uh, uh, almost uh, Equal, uh, even less <coughs> of the radius of a proton. So to have a, a detectable signal, we need to uh, search for this signal in the universe in a big uh, mass that are moving. So we are looking for uh, massive stars that uh, can coalesce, explode, and change. Uh, accelerate, and then we can detect uh, this uh, signal. The, the most uh, frequent uh, signal that we detect and uh, at, uh, are easy to detect is the collection of two, uh, by, uh, two, two stars, um, mostly we detect uh, black holes, uh, that uh, start uh, rotating uh, one each, uh, around the other, so at, uh, uh, at a certain point of this rotation or that just uh, um, collapse, uh, creating a, a new uh, object. This uh, effort was uh, essentially an international effort. <coughs> there are three um, detectors already operating, that are Virgo in Italy, and uh, the two uh, LIGO interferometer that are in the USA. Very soon there will be also the Japanese one, Kagra, and uh, we, there is the plan also to build a, a new interferometer in India. And there is also a small one in, uh, in, in Germany that uh, has a, a very little sensitivity with respect to this uh, operating uh, detector. Uh, you may have heard about the two big discoveries that we did in the last two years. The first was uh, the, uh, the detection of the first detection of gravitational waves due to uh, two black holes <coughs> that uh, um, let us win the Nobel Prize. And, but uh, even most interesting, if it is possible, was the detection last year of the collection of two neutron stars. This was a, a very big result because uh, while the detection of uh, uh, black holes just produce uh, gravitational waves and nothing else, the collection of two uh, neutron stars um, emitted also electromagnetic counterpart. So this event was detected, detected not only by the gravitational wave experiments, but also by all of the other astronomical observatories that detect the, this event in uh, optical, X-ray, ra radio, uh, radio frequency, gamma ray burst. So <coughs> it was um, uh, detected in, in all the spectrum of, uh, of emission. So why we uh, start thinking to the application of machine learning and gravitational waves? I will uh, uh, just show some examples of, uh, of uh, application where machine learning can, uh, can be useful for, for us. For, for example, I will talk about glitch classification. 
the uh, application for noise removal and uh, <coughs> also a possibility to apply this uh, technique in a real time analysis. Uh, the data that this kind of experiment uh, acquire are essentially time series. Uh, we detect uh, time series that are mostly noise, uh, noisy time series, and hidden in this noise, we have to identify a very small gravitational wave signal. So um, the signal that we want to detect uh, are essentially three main categories. <coughs> What we call, sorry for my voice and my cough, but this is, uh, I, I was a bit, a bit sick. Uh, there are the category that we define a known signal. Uh, what it does mean? It means that we know from theoretical point of view what will be the signal waveforms. So this is an easy way to detect because we know uh, which signal we are looking for, and we, we can apply the optimal uh, methods to detect them, that are, that are the so-called the Mitchell or Wiener filter. <coughs> then there is a category of signal which we know, uh, we, which we call unknown, because we don't know very well the physical uh, phenomena that cause the emission of uh, uh, gravitational waves. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, core collapse supernova. We have only numerical simulation, uh, but different numerical simulation about these waveforms because are linked to the properties of the collapsed star. <coughs> then the most frequent uh, signals in our data are noisy. So we have a different kind of noise. We have what we call broadband noise, so that uh, um, was uh, spread in all the, the frequency band of our detector. We have moving lines and we have uh, glitch noise. Glitch for us are very short uh, signal, what we call transient signal, that are due not to <coughs> gravitational wave signal, <coughs> but to noise. I hope to arrive to the end of the presentation. <laughs> I lied. <laughs> so in this, um, in this plot, you can see the real uh, uh, signal that we detect. On uh, the left, there are uh, the first triple detection with the <coughs> detected by Virgo uh, and the two LIGO. And on the, on the right, there is uh, the um, binary uh, neutral star collection. This uh, uh, is how they look like in time domain and in time frequency domain. In this slide, there is a gallery of glitch that are due not to signal, but to noise. So you can understand how <coughs> difficult it could be. It is a problem. <coughs> how difficult it could be to identify in this mass of glitch and the real signal. Then there are also other kinds of signals, I said, that are this uh, broadband noise that are moving, that we need to remove from our data <coughs> to identify correctly the parameter of our signal. So why machine learning? Because we have a lot of data that uh, we need to acquire, because beside the main gravitational channel, we need to acquire a lot of sensors around the instruments to monitor the environmental noise or other source of noise. With the new detector, we can have <coughs> one gravitational wave per week or even per day. So we should be fast in uh, clearly identifying what is a gravitational signal with respect to the, the noise. So machine learning can help in different ways. From the side of data conditioning, we can, uh, for example, use machine learning to identify nonlinear coupling in the instruments and to remove this noise using deep learning. From the point of view of signal detection identification, we can use classification methods to disentangle noise, 
perso il signal. <coughs> in LIGO Virgo there is a lot of activity around this, uh, this uh, around the machine learning. We create a working group and there are many active projects that start considering the application of machine learning to analyze our data. I will show some examples. Uh, one of the most important work is Gravity Spy. It's a citizen project that asks to the general public to label our glitch. And this is important because we need to have a training set with the labeled glitch. <coughs> Then there is a work also on noise removal. Try to identify the nonlinear noise and to remove from the data. There are also work for uh, the application of machine learning to detect signal. <coughs> Instead of using <coughs> the optimal Wilner filter that require the creation of a huge number of templates and the matching with the data to identify the real waveforms, a group started to do the same job with the deep uh, learning, training a network on the templates and then detecting the signal injected. <coughs> the performance are similar to the optimal filtering. So this is an important um, work that we could use in the future. What is the strategy of our glitch classification? As I said, we have the main ch uh, channel <coughs> where there should be the gravitational signal. Then we have a lot of auxiliary channel that acquire data and that can have this transient signal. So the idea is to build a, a training set from these uh, uh, channels, detect the glitch, extract the feature, and then apply or unsupervised machine learning technique or supervised machine learning technique taking advantage of the label of the training set. Once we have this training pipeline, the idea is that uh, acquiring new data, we will be able in time to do a prediction on uh, the nature of this signal, if they are noise or gravitational waves. So this is a long list of projects <coughs> that are around in LIGO Virgo, because this, is an, mm, this could help um, to be real-time uh, detector. I will show two examples of uh, application of uh, uh, machine learning to do uh, glitch classification. One is image-based and the other is wavelet-based. <coughs> we uh, make a, mm, a test of the, uh, the quality of uh, the classification using convolutional neural network that are, as we know, uh, very popular to classify the image. In our field, we uh, could produce the image, or very often we have already the image because we use them while we are monitoring the data in a control room. So we are producing this image, <coughs> we have a glitch, and we can use it to do a classification. So in this work, we decided to work first on simulated data. So we simulated noise data that uh, mimic the sensitivity of the LIGO detector, advanced LIGO detector. We inject in this data uh, known glitch and we try to classify them with the convolutional neural network. So, um, this is a realistic uh, data set because we try to simulate signals that are very similar to what we found in our data. So <coughs> we inject six categories of signal, Gaussian, sing Gaussian, ring down, chip like, scatter light, and whist like, plus um, 
another category of signal that we call generally noise uh, that uh, are due to random noise in our data. With this uh, uh, simulated family glitch, we try to inject them in the data with a, a given uh, uh, SNR distribution in order to span all the, the possibility from the from the very low signal to noise ratio to high signal to noise ratio to see if we are able to detect also very low signal to noise ratio signal. <coughs> we produce the image. <coughs> First of all, we apply <coughs> what it's often in our uh, communities, the whitening procedure. We try to remove all the such remote in order to enhance the, um, the transient signal. So this is our training set, and we apply a CNN. This is a simple CNN in some sense. Uh, we, we have not a big GPU to do the test, so we, for us it's just a case study. And we see that in, uh, after we train the, this pipeline that requires some hours, Often in a few milliseconds, we are able to do a prediction. We compare the, our result with the standard uh, machine learning technique, uh, linear support vector machine or uh, shell or CNN. <coughs> Obviously, the uh, three CNN blocks uh, was, was the, the best performed. This is uh, the confusion matrix of the results. As you can see, the accuracy that we reach was uh, uh, very uh, above uh, the 90%. So uh, with this kind of data, we reach almost <laughs> the 100% uh, accuracy in detecting uh, and classifying this kind of glitch. And even when there are, for example, two different glitch in the same image, we are able to detect the, um, to identify correctly the central grid. We use the same data set uh, with a different uh, pipeline. Uh, this is a pipeline based on the web at the composition of the signal. So we acquire data, we perform the whitening in time, in time domain. <coughs> We do the wavelet transform of this data, window by window. We apply the noise procedure in order that we keep only the wavelet coefficient that are above the noise uh, background. And we consider this wavelet coefficient as the only one that can describe the waveforms of our signal. So we estimate some parameters and we start producing the trigger list where we have some metaparameters that are the signal to noise ratio, the frequency, the duration of, the, of the, the signal, plus all the coefficient of the wavelet transform. Because in this wavelet coefficient, there, are, there is contained the waveforms of the signal. Uh, we, to have a better uh, identification of the parameter of the waveforms, uh, we perform a clustering in the, in the wavelet map. We just keep the coefficient that are above a, a given threshold, but also that are close in the wavelet map. Uh, so we are sure that we are building correctly only the event and not adding other uh, we uh, apply this time instead of, of deeper learning uh, a, a, three, uh, a three ensemble um, pipeline, it is XG Boost. It is a very, uh, a very good pipeline uh, for classification. And we um, apply, we call uh, all this uh, pipeline WDX. What we did is uh, essentially uh, apply all the, the pipeline to detect the signal, create this uh, uh, trigger list, and uh, apply <coughs> the classification. In the past, we published also some papers using unsupervised classification, where we just uh, try to identify main glitch family, so cluster of a glitch, 
but the efficiency was not so high. Now, uh, now that we have this uh, labeled training set, we apply this supervised classification. <coughs> so with the WDF, we were able to uh, first detect 97% uh, of the signal that were injected, but we have to consider that we have also signal injected with signal to noise ratio that is equal to one, so almost impossible to detect. And we have a good parameter estimation of the signal that we inject. With this uh, um, data set, we apply this machine learning uh, XG boost pipeline in uh, two uh, different ways. Uh, first, we test the binary classification. That means uh, we try to identify chirp-like signal that are similar to gravitational wave signal versus all the rest of the signal. <coughs> so uh, binary classification for us will be signal, gravitational signal versus noise. And then apply also a multi-label classification where we try to classify each glitch in a the defined, defined class. For the binary classification, we have a good uh, performance. Uh, overall, accuracy is above 90%, uh, much lesser than the deep learning, but uh, we know that there are limitations in this application that are essentially due to the fact that we are using a small window to uh, characterize the signal and not uh, maybe we lose part of the signal. And for the multi label classification, it is even more evident because there are class for uh, which we are almost unable to correctly identify them, but the overall accuracy uh, is uh, 80%. Um, these pipeline are now in uh, updating uh, version. We are working on a new uh, pipeline that uh, started from this uh, WDFX uh, that uh, will, uh, can be used for a real time because uh, the difference between um, the deep learning is that we <coughs> can avoid to produce the image. We can detect the signal while acquiring data. So uh, it uh, uh, could be a good solution for uh, classific classification of uh, the signal while we are acquiring signal. So this is a uh, uh, working, uh, uh, working progress job. Another uh, way, as I said, in which we uh, use, can use the deep learning is um, the uh, non-linear identification. Uh, Gabriele Valiente uh, and his colleague at LIGO started this job on simulated data. And uh, me and uh, um, a student, a PhD student, has tried to do the same for Virgo. The idea is that... Uh, <coughs> I don't know if there is... Uh, yes. The idea is that uh, in our data, there could be uh, non-linear coupling. Uh, for example, we know that uh, alignment of uh, some optical part can, uh, can uh, coupling in a non-linear way and can uh, produce non-linear noise. So the idea is to identify some uh, witness channel that we know contribute to the nonlinear noise. And uh, once identified them through the deep learning pipeline, we can also remove <coughs> from the data. And this is also working in progress because we reproduce the results on simulated data where we know what we are injected, how they are nonlinear coupled, and we remove them, as you can see here. <coughs> Now we are trying to do the same also on real data, where we don't know which is the source of nonlinear coupling and which are the good channel that uh, couple. So we have hints from uh, uh, experimental physicists that are working there, and we are trying to uh, remove this nonlinear noise. Hmm. Um, we are doing this with a recurrent neural network that are better tuned for time series with respect to CNN. So my last uh, slide was just to uh, 
uh, about the project we won, um, about the machine learning uh, for application in gravitational waves, geophysics, uh, and robotics, where uh, Fabio also is involved, with uh, the idea of uh, uh, using this uh, technique to have a better data analysis in, in the fields, uh, either from the gravitational wave detectors, detection, but also from, for the uh, data conditioning. So in, in, uh, identify the noise, remove them, uh, build a model that can uh, in real time monitor this noise, and uh, which let us remove the data, in, uh, uh, the noise from our data in real time. So this is the links if you are interested to have more information about what's going on there. And thanks for listening to me also with this problem with my throat. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Elena, for your inspiring talk. Uh, I think, uh, it, it, of course, from since this is an interdisciplinary community, it's possible that for some uh, of you uh, it has been uh, uh, technical at some point, but I think uh, you, you need, uh, we all need to, to see the real stuff. And uh, in the case uh, of Elena, it's real stuff we have from the frontier. Actually, she, she didn't tell you that uh, she's one of the thousand or so recipients uh, of the Breakthrough Prize. <laughs> which is the Silicon Valley version of the Nobel Prize. So, you have to know that. <laughs> so, um, I don't know if I, I open it, the floor if you have questions or comments or whatever. And the monitoring with... Uh, So, uh, I have a question, uh, Elena. Um, so, in these times, uh, it's, uh, deep learning is uh, very popular, uh, which is a special kind of uh, machine learning. So, what's your, you see, what the, you see, what benefits you see in exploiting machine learning with respect uh, to, so deep learning with respect to other techniques? Because some people now maybe think that deep learning is everything. Uh, deep learning is uh, useful, useful even because we can use different hardware to run it. So we can take advantage of the use of GPU and this can <coughs> really make uh, the pipeline fast. Mm, with the standard technique, that are not tuned for GPU, you are less efficient in, uh, in speed. But uh, uh, deep learning is also evolving in, uh, in many aspects. And uh, for us, uh, uh, but even in, in other fields where you don't know how, how well you have to model, uh, if you are able to model the um, the physical model that is underground your data, uh, deep learning that also is also the capacity to <coughs> to catch the nonlinearity in the data could be uh, important. So sometimes we have this uh, background. So I, I don't know if there are. Uh, other questions uh, or remarks uh, from any of the uh, attendees? If, uh, if there are not, uh, I, I want to thanks again, uh, uh, thank again uh, Elena for his uh, her great talk. And um, so maybe we can give uh, an end. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Elena. Thanks. Now we, we stop for uh, some uh, 10 minutes uh, and then we, we restart uh, at 10 past 10 CAT, uh, hopefully with uh, um,
the next speaker who is uh, Joanna Bryson, Professor Bryson, who actually we connected from uh, um, Princeton. So it's about four in the morning, four a.m. in the morning there, and uh, I hope that uh, she could hear the alarm because uh, she is not <laughs> giving any sign of life at the moment. So. Okay, it's our, we, we wait from uh, until 20 uh, past 10. Oh, uh, <laughs> if she doesn't show up, uh, I will continue with another lecture. So thank you uh, again. Thank you, and, uh, uh, thank you everybody. And uh, see you in 10 minutes. <laughs> I will leave uh, the meeting open anyway. Bye, I have to leave. Ciao, Elena. Ciao. Hi, Joanna, welcome. Okay, so I wanted to give a special thank you. As uh, told before, we, we will start uh, in a few minutes. Actually, since Joanna is here, we, we may start uh, in uh, Hi, Joanna. Hi, now we're joining us at this very early 
hour in the morning, in your morning. <laughs> so we, we, we can start in, uh, say, five minutes. <laughs> so I, I have to say that I was uh, a bit uh, worried because, uh, so, well, I know you are a very professional person, but this is tough, so thank you, really thanks. And professional, but disorganized, so. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Well, actually, I am very good, uh, uh, you know, the story of uh, um, genius uh, and uh, not being regulated. I'm not, I'm very good in being disorganized, uh, so I miss other qualities, but. As a disorganized <laughs> person, I am thinking a top performer. <laughs> okay. If, uh... uh. So we can start in five minutes. Okay. Okay, I think I'm ready now. <laughs> <laughs> I was confused for a while because uh, I was looking all over the place. How did the first talk go? I think it was good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, it was definitely good. It was definitely. Oh, are you doing a summary thing at the end again? Yeah, summary. Summary. What, what do you mean? Uh, oh, I don't know. I feel like the last time you did it that you actually sort of said something at the beginning or the end. Ah, yes. I will do something like that, yes. Okay. Actually, today it's a, a completely outsourced lecture because we are two guest lectures. Oh, okay. Now we do just uh, make some. Well, we should get started. It's it's already four fifteen. So. Okay. I think uh... the students look bored. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Do you want to start? Yes, if, um, I, I just... Uh, so, um, as told before, uh, welcome uh, John, uh, Professor Bryson from the University of Bath. Uh, uh, and uh, the Princeton Center uh, and Princeton. Actually, today she, she is uh, uh, connecting from, from the US, so a special thanks to her for this. Uh, actually, um, Professor uh, Bryson is one of the leading uh, scholars uh, in, in AI. And uh, today she will talk about something which is uh, we, we already introduced uh, in the first lecture somehow, and it is something that is worrying uh, a lot of people. So it's uh, together with uh, a state of a uh, critical state of the art on AI to try to understand what can be the, the, um, the societal impact and in particular the impact on, uh, on the economy and how this uh, impact can be politically sustainable because uh, some people, as you know, are worried. So I give directly the floor to, to Joanna and uh, back on again, and uh, the, shop is floor. the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I agreed to do this when it looked like it was going to be at 10 in the morning, and of course it's 4 in the morning. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> because I didn't realize that I was uh, in different continents at the different times, but anyway. Um, so, oops, and now that's my alarm telling me that I should start, right? Sorry about that. 
Okay, right. <laughs> so, um, well, let's just get started. Uh, before we can talk very much about uh, the political sustainable economy, and I'll get to that towards the end, um, I should say I'm an expert in artificial intelligence, and I'm only learning about economics, but I am working on uh, papers with leading political economists and, and trying to get on top of that. Because I've been doing AI ethics for decades, but it's become obvious that um, you know, the, the, key, the core part of ethics is how it impacts society. And this is something I can add value in because I've also been working on understanding human cooperation since, uh, well, I, since about 2005, because I was interested in the evolution of cognition. And it turns out that a lot of cognition is culture, um, or at least every species that has a lot of cognition shares information. And that's a form of cooperation. All right, but let's just get into this. First of all, um, I know this is a whole Shanghai series on AI, so I probably don't need to do this at length, um, but I, uh, I will. <laughs> I, I, before we talk too much about how we govern the use of AI, I'm going to define my terms. Now, I know you guys have a good idea of what AI is, but this is what I'm talking about, all right? So with respect to the rest of this talk, I'm just going to refer to intelligence as the capacity to do the right thing at the right time. Now, some people think this is a very reductionist uh, definition, but in fact, I recently found out it goes back to 1883. Um, and this is definitely the definition I was taught, both when I was a psychologist that started out as an undergraduate and also when I first came into AI. So if you have a nice definition of AI like this, it's the capacity to perceive and then to act on, based on that perception, right? Then artificial intelligence, the only thing that diff is different is that it's something that you've built, that someone has built, that a, that a human, a member of our society has built deliberately, all right? So um, the big question then when you're talking about governance is whether or not anything uh, changes the responsibility for that deliberate action, and I'm going to assert. Now, the first two parts were definitions. This is an assertion. I don't see any reason that, um, the, that, that because you've built something that you've put some intelligence in, that, that changes your responsibility for having created that, app, that system, all right? But before I go into that at length, let's go into a little bit more discussion about um, intelligence. If you're going from perception to action, that's a form of computation. That is, it's a transformation of information, right? And, and computation is not math, all right? It's, it's a physical process. It takes time, it takes energy, and it takes space. So a lot of the responsibility and accountability derives from this, all right? If you're gonna do the right thing at the right time, you know, you could say, oh no, we'll just use learning, we don't have to use search. Learning is a kind of search. It's a search for the right parameters so that your system will work, all right? So let's just talk about search as in planning. Um, the cost of search, again, I assume you guys already have this, so I'm going very fast. If you aren't, wave. I can see you, so wave if, I don't, if I'm going too fast over something. But basically, the cost of search is proportional to the number of options and how long each of those options takes, right? Again, it's about time, which people often forget. And then that's raised to the number of actions, okay? So, for example, if you have a robot that can do 100 things, and you want it to, you know, to figure out what the right thing is, and it has to look empirically and see, then the worst case, it has to try each of those 100 things. But what if it has a two-step plan, right? It has to turn left and then go forward, but it doesn't know that. That could mean trying up to 10,000 plans already. That's combinatorial explosion. That's why computation is hard. That's why intelligence is hard, right? So that's, that's why intelligence is hard, not, not computation. So I think it was Claude Shannon, the guy who did the information theory, that sat down and worked out that the, there's more 35 move games of chess, you know, not the ones where you infinitely move the rook back and forth, but like, you know, normal games. When there are atoms in the universe. And I know that's hard to believe, but just Google it. <laughs> because, because the numbers are there. It works out. And there's a lot more stuff that we can do with our lives, any biological organism can do, than there are moves in chess. All right? So... How do we, how are we intelligent at all? Mostly for humans, it's concurrency, right? So concurrency saves you time, but it doesn't save you any energy and it doesn't, and it requires basically more space. So you can go out and buy two computers, it'll take half as long, but it'll take the same amount of energy and, and, and you have to have two computers, right? 
And it may be that, you know, some people really believe that quantum is, is the explanation. There, there used to be a guy no one talks about anymore called Penrose, that said we can't have artificial intelligence until we have quantum computing, and there must be quantum computing in the brain. I find it incredibly unlikely that we're going to get something for magic. First of all, not every algorithm can you actually do in quantum, but if you can do it with quantum, then it does save space, all right? But secondly, okay, people are claiming that we're going to suddenly magically not use energy, but, but the only tame physicist I have is this one. This is with Kenton of Durham, and, and <laughs> there's like, apparently no one is really computing this, but it would be amazing if the universe gave us something for nothing. And right now, um, quantum computing is costing enormous amounts of energy because they, they super cool everything, right? So, so it seems unlikely that we're going to get something for nothing. Given all this, then artificial general intelligence is not actually a threat, okay? You can't just suddenly know everything. If, if by artificial general intelligence you mean omniscience, right? That's, that's one country is going to discover the algorithm that's going to give it the lead and then we'll never be able to recover because it's not just the lead, it's on this one, right? Not a real problem, okay? Yeah, so I, I just said this. There's actually several myths because people mean several different things by artificial general intelligence. And one of the things, I mean, two of them are contradictory. Thinking that you're going to know all the stuff and thinking you're going to be human-like. Because humans, like, I don't even know where my keys are, right? We, we certainly don't know all the stuff. All right, um, but let's, let's talk about this general intelligence idea. Uh, artificial intelligence is in general. We, we used to think this, like, you know, there's this guy named Skinner um, <laughs> that you may have heard of behaviorism. It was something they believed in the early 20th century. Um, and actually, behaviorists are still around, but they don't believe this thing anymore, right? It's not that any stimulus can, you can learn to get a res response from any stimulus, all right? We proved that wrong, right? We just went out and checked. So you can teach a pigeon in a box like this to peck in order to get food, or if you're mean and you put like a shack in, the, in that metal part at the bottom, uh, a pigeon will have to flap its wings to get away from a shack. But a pigeon can't learn to flap its wings to get, to get food, and it can't learn to peck to avoid a shack, all right? It's just like dogs can't learn to unwind their, their leash, right? It's like, it seems obvious. But no, this is going back to the restraints, the constraints on computation and why we can't remember where our keys are, right? So first of all, let me just say, this is why science works. We, it's our whole project to keep improving stuff. And I hate it when people say like, oh, you know, the top journals are the worst journals because the papers get corrected the most. It's like, no, if a paper gets corrected, that means someone's read it, right? Science is a constant, you're constantly improving. But anyway, um, Given all this, how do we know anything? Well, one of the things is that you do parallel, you do concurrency. We've got 7 billion people. We've got more than 7 billion people. And we're getting much better at making sure all those people have you know, enough food, enough education, and they're connected to each other and can talk to each other, right? Especially with AI and, and ICT. It's not just AI. But, but with you know, mobile phones and with machine translation, all kinds of things are happening that, that are exploding this. But we've been really good at this forever. We are the apes with language, right? So this is something that is why we're dominating the ecosystem, right? And now we don't only do this you know, ourselves, we also do this with our computers. So we're using our computers to, um, to help us explore the space, but also, what machine learning is, is it's basically doing what people do. It's uploading the stuff we've already learned into computers, right? And that's why in the last 10 years, you've seen this just unbelievable, and I'm sorry these videos are now slightly out of date, but they're still useful, right? Because it's unbelievable that, that we have, uh, you know, the, the Watson thing, the, the thing on the bottom is language, right? That was done by mining Wikipedia and various other language sources, right? There was a mistake they made where they mined um, the, uh, the Urban Dictionary because it's a generative model, so start saying rude things too, and they had to unmine that. <laughs> but anyway, the top one, look at the, the reason that that robot looks so human-like is because they use motion capture. So we're not only mining, um, we're not only mining stuff that uh, the humans have discovered, we've, we're mining stuff that biology has discovered. If you can make that distinction, of course, humans are biological, right? 
but it's stuff that we have in our genes as well as stuff that we have in our culture, all right? And we're superhuman already. We're superhuman not only at chess and go, but at things like speech transcription, lip reading, detecting whether or not you're lying by the way you stand, right? Or by, the, by, by your, your hand pressure, right? We can forge voices. You know, humans can imitate too, but we can forge video. That's something humans can't do in real time, except with AI. But we can do that now, and it's coming. Everybody's saying that'll be the biggest, there'll be some big political scandal in the next year or two about that. But, but you know, dictionaries have more knowledge than any human is going to have. We've been superhuman with AI for a long time, right? So as I said, the spectacular recent growth that we've seen recently um, is because we've gotten very, very good at figuring out how to upload those discoveries into um, our computation, okay? So this is also, I'm not talking about this today, but you'll all think I did. <laughs> There's a thing uh, where, where if women start talking about bias, that, that's like a normal thing to talk about. So but I'm not gonna talk about this at length, but this is a paper we had that came out last year showing that, um, that the implicit biases that Americans have uh, about gender and about race are also in word embeddings. So you can find it when you do Google translation and things like that too, right? Why? Because AI is just I, it's just the intelligence we have. And it, so it turns out that our implicit biases is part of our, basically our knowledge, right? And the same uh, word embeddings that, that, that return um, these sexist assumptions about, you know, like gen, you know, women's names being closer to the um, family. Also um, return fairly accurately things like what proportion of people who hold a job are women. So those dots on the right side of the screen, the blue dots are jobs like programmer, where unfortunately there aren't many women. I was astounded by that because when I was a programmer, it was like 12% women and then it peaked at 18% women. Right now it's like 4% women. So that was one of the things that freaked me out about this paper. And then the red dots at the top are like things like a uh, nurse that are mostly women. And so the, so the sexism of the vectors is actually fairly accurate uh, 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 de description of the US labor statistics. Um, and this is, comes from mining the English language web. So America dominates the English language web, which is not surprising. Um, but what is surprising is that, that we have actually come up with a new account for the implicit bias in humans, but then we've also shown it that it's in AI. All right. Anyway, that was just an aside. I want to talk, I, I told you before um, uh, that artificial general intelligence isn't a problem, but there's another thing people talk about, which is the intelligence explosion or superintelligence. It's this idea that um, a self-improving machine, a machine that can learn to learn, results in exponential growth. And I.J. Good thought that was a great thing. He thought, he thought like, okay, we'll program this thing and it'll just work and do stuff for us. That's great. Um, Nick Bostrom makes it sound like it's a terrible thing. And one of the reasons Nick Bostrom does that is because he talks about unintended consequences. So even if we keep the control of the AI um, and, and, and we're the ones who determine its goals, um, if we let it solve some of the sub-problems, it might do something we didn't expect. Like for example, it might, um, you might say here, please robot organize, you know, organize all the offices. And the robot turns the whole planet into paper clips in the, in, in the attempt to organize all the paper, right? So that's one of the things uh, Boston talks about. So superintelligence, I would not say is a myth. I think that the reasoning there is good, but there's a different kind of problem, okay? Um, I, the problem is, you know, just to give you a tip, projecting this problem into the future. Because if you think about um, intelligence as something you can decompose, then you can think that every single machine we've ever built, you know, for example, writing, all right, have already been examples of AI. I mean, writing is off-board memory. And if you look at, um, yeah, so 12,000 years of AI. But if you want to look at when did we get writing, we got it about 10,000 years ago. Okay, so this graph shows you that 10,000 years ago, there, there were only on the order of about you know, 10 million people on the planet. There were more macaques. There are still more macaques than 10 million, right? Macaques are kind of more, right? So we're on all the different continents by 10,000 years ago. But look, not only does this curve look like an exponential, but notice it's on a log scale. Look at the y scale, it's a log scale. So it's exponential on a log, it's exponential exponential, right? So 
the, the, the idea of the intelligence explosion is coherent. When you can learn how to learn, when you can, when you can save that information, that allows you to innovate, and then you can just you know, do incredible things. All right, so what is the problem with superintelligence? As we mentioned before, unanticipated consequences, right? And so one of the end, yeah, this, now we're starting to get into sustainability. So now we're coming to, this, to the, the main part of my talk. Um, just, yeah, did we turn? yeah, okay. So <laughs> this is the XKCD version of sustainability. I mean, look at this. The gray in the middle is, this is all the land animals on the planet as of like 2000, I forget, like 2004 or something. This is a relatively recent XKCD just a few years ago, but he's using data from like a decade before that. So now we're talking about 15 years ago and this is an accelerating process, okay? So there's dark gray in the middle is the humans. The, the big crescent on the left is the cows, right? And the bright green is what wild animals were left 15 years ago. There's a lot fewer now. So nobody ever said, let's get rid of all the wild animals, but that's an unanticipated consequence. This is a more scientific paper, and there's a couple more papers that come out more recently than this. You can ask me uh, if you need another citation or just look it up yourself. But you can see we were already, you know, reducing the number of species as we would hit a continent. But it's nothing compared to when we started to do writing. And at the same time as writing, we had agriculture and we had doctrinal religion. So not everybody agrees that writing is the thing. I'm just emphasizing AI here, <laughs> all right? But certainly you can see that, that um, what we're doing is we're replacing biomass that was already there with biomass that is us, ourselves, right, and our animals. Okay. So now I'm not talking about uh, so much about biological sustainability, but focusing more on AI and, as I mentioned before, ICT more generally, right? So like, you know, including the, the, um, the mobile phones. All right, one of the things people really worry about, unless, well, actually, even the Americans and Chinese worry about this, but live on each other, right? So China is like, why does America have such great, great AI, right? And, and actually, I was just there for the World Economic Forum that does a thing in the summer. And people were saying, you know, Americans and Europeans tend to say, oh, China, you know, they're an autocracy and they got one and a half billion people. They've got all the data and machine learning is based on data. Okay, first of all, I think that's a misunderstanding of statistics, right? You don't need data about every person to learn. You only need... Um, well, how much data you need is proportional to how much variation there's in the population. That's why when you do a survey, you only survey a couple thousand people to understand what millions of people are doing. So the biggest use for big data is to be able to predict everybody in your population as an individual. It's not something that's, that you actually need 1.5 billion people to get data. But anyway, uh, the people in China, I was on a, Chinese, a mostly Chinese panel organized by Tencent. They were worried about the fact that the American data is better than the Chinese data. And this is actually a known effect. If the data is collected by the government, it doesn't tend to be as good, right? Because, you know, governments have different goals. And, and so, so you actually do need more data if you're, you're, getting, you're having it collected by a government organization. So, um, so anyway, as I mentioned, and, and I can tell you, I was in the in D.C. Uh, about a year, oh, almost is it 2017 so yeah about a year ago um and definitely the americans were really worried about this thing about the magic algorithm and if the chinese found it first right which makes no sense but that was what they were worried about <laughs> right so yeah so they worry about each other but the rest of the world also worries about this okay so um i you guys are uh let's see you're, you're in the eu and where is S R S U H? have you yes where is RSUH? Uh, it's in Moscow. Oh, Moscow, okay. So, the, the Russia. So, the, um, I actually don't know that much about Rus what Russians worry about, although I can guess, but they don't come to as many of the meetings I go to. But, but, but I do go to a lot of meetings with people from Japan and China, and, um, and increasingly now, um, like Africa and South, South America, um, and, and India, of course, uh, uh, because I'm basically a British academic, and there's a, a strong connection with India and Pakistan, of course. Um, so so uh, people in different regions worry about different things, um, and a lot of them are worried about, like, can we keep up with those guys? And in, in particular, Japan is trying to coordinate efforts 
And the EU is now trying to coordinate efforts. So the EU is m making a massive investment in public infrastructure. Because as I mentioned before, it's not just about data and it's not just about algorithms. A lot of it is about the computational and, and people have sort of been blindsided by this. But like Google, it doesn't even, it builds all its own ships now. It has its own fiber optics around the entire planet. It, it doesn't trust anybody because it's been hacked. It's got hacked by its own government. You know, that was one of the things Snowden showed was that the NSA was hacking Google. So Google, uh, and not just Google, you know, Amazon, all these people that you've heard of have enormous, enormous banks of servers. It's a huge capital investment. It's not only about data and it's not only about algorithms. It's about processing and electricity. You know, these companies own rivers to provide the power that they need to have their data processing, right? So this is, this is gigantic. And so um, the EU is, has uh, said we're going to spend, I don't remember, like $10 billion, um, trying to come up with this data, data processing uh, capacity in a public sense. And that's, an, that's another innovation. So you know, part of the success of China has been, although there's massive government investment, it is being done through a sort of semi-capitalistic way. So companies are still doing a lot. So if the EU manages to do this from central, really centralized organization, that would be amazing. Um, but there, there are, you know, and then if you look at what's happening in uh, South Asia and in Africa, people are working on trying to connect things together with that are lower power devices, but, but therefore, of course, they're, they're emphasizing more connected the communities together. Anyway, one of the things, besides this concerns about, about like a few places having a lot of power, uh, there's also concerns about social disruption. And some of that comes from the empowerment of individuals, which is both beautiful, it's amazing, you know, like anybody can go anywhere in the world and, and have machine translation and know where the good restaurants are and know where the good, you know, where you can sleep or whatever. But of course, that's one of the things that enables migration. Anybody can go anywhere in the world. And migration is a bad thing, I'm a migrant. Um, but some people find it threatening, right? And, and especially when you have, you combine it with things like uh, climate change, and then you have very systematic uh, uh, migration and people find it uh, challenging. So another thing about ICT is that the rapid formation of new social identities, and people worry about this a lot. They worry that um, people from other, you know, across the borders are influencing populations within their own countries or, or that, um, that people, you know, yeah, the people feel like uh, Theresa May, the, uh, the, the Prime Minister of the UK said, if you think you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere. That's because she was opposed to the EU and so she was talking about Brexit. Um, so, so you get uh, people that are worried about the fact that the, that the identities people have are not the traditional ones. And actually, I worry a little bit about this. Well, uh, um, Again, I think there are global problems we have to solve, like sustainable, you know, global sustainability that do require global identities. But at the same time, there's a lot of other problems that you have to solve, like uh, you know, just making sure that your water is clean and that the kids that live near you are getting good education so that you're living in a positive economy and then there's, there's lower crime. Those are problem, problems that have to be solved locally. So an awful lot of human experience derives from our physical location. And it's important that we are invested in our local identity as well as these other global identities, right? Um, more generally, this loss of the importance of distance may lead into uh, the communication of wealth and power across national borders. So again, nation states aren't able to uh, protect their citizens in the same way as they used to. Right? And they're also not able to get money from their citizens in the way they used to. Right? So now we have a different set of problems. How do we regulate Facebook and Google? It's a global problem, but supposedly governments are national. Right? And, the, and the solutions that Ameri America has a problem too, obviously. I guess a lot of people know about the elections and things like that. But their problems are a bit different from the rest of the world's problems with these American companies. And interestingly, China, so, there's, so the world is kind of an N equals two experiments about the internet because China built something people call the Great Firewall of China. And they basically kept the, the Western services out. And yet their economy looks the same as the rest of the global economy. So at the same point, their uh, tech giants passed their petrochemical and their, uh, and their uh, manufacturing, right? So that's happened on both sides of the Great Firewall at about the same time. So even though in China you do have one government in charge of the solar infrastructure, 
still there's a there's a there, there's high high in economic inequality which makes it harder to govern right so yeah when i think the lot of the concentration of wealth and business you know people see the corruption that's true when you have inequality you can create corruption but i think part of it just comes from the fact that we have uh, a technology that that allows you to be able to go and find the best search engine right if we were going to go out and have coffee after this, even, we're not even in the same place, but say we were in one room, we wouldn't go to the best coffee place in the world. We probably wouldn't go to the best coffee place in the town you guys are in. Rather, we would go to some place that was kind of close. So, so distance used to matter. And then, as I mentioned, it still matters. But, um, with, that, but with now, you know, almost except for, except for China, like 97% of searches or 90% of searches or something is happening on Google. We're all going to the same place that we've decided is the best. And so that means they get all the advertising money, right? And that's a problem. It's a huge problem for newspapers, right? But it's also, um, it's also a problem because of how it uh, tips the way power works, okay? So yeah, inequality matters. Um, and some people say, well, how, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe who cares if Google has all the money, they're a nice company, and, um, and more generally in society, who cares uh, how rich the rich are if the poor are improving? And to some extent, that's true, all right? So, for example, one of the main things that predicts a state failure is if you have babies start to die. It's called infant mortality, all right? And if you can't keep babies alive, then your government is pretty likely to fail. And, and this is a very, it's one of, the, uh, one of the few things you can point at in political science and say that's a law that they figured out, that the best predictor of state failure is infant mortality, right? So, um, so yeah, and that, so that is the like absolute poverty is one of the things that can contribute to that. But in general, inequality really does matter. Okay, how can we talk about this? The way we talk about inequality normally, and that's not the only way, but it's one of the ones people, it's a shorthand, it's a single number. And of course, single numbers are never enough, but at least it's an abstraction we can grab. It's something coefficient. Okay, for me, the words are more clear. For some people, the, the numbers are gonna be more clear here. Like my husband, too. he's like, why do you have words on this slide? <laughs> yeah. But for me, the words are more clear. It, but basically what you're measuring is just the, um, the, the, you know, how different are different people's uh, uh, incomes or wealth? Wealth actually turns out to be, income is easier to measure, or historically it was easier to measure, but wealth is probably the bigger uh, effect, right? But we're just saying how different are people's wealth, um, you know, over the, the, the mean of the wealth, right? Does that make sense? So you can read the equation, right? So, um, so, if everybody's so looking at the left graph that I've just put up, if everybody uh, had the same amount of money, then you'd have a straight line, right? When you have 50% of the population, you have 50% of the wealth, all right? But if the Gini coefficient is bigger than zero, right, then you're gonna have like 50% of the population has less than 50% of the wealth, right? Um, assuming you have them sorted by who's the wealthiest here, right? So, and then the, the most extreme Gini coefficient is one. One person has all the money, right? So that's the thing that you see on the far right, that, that you, you had no money, no money, no money. Oh, one guy has all the money, right? But normally you're going to get something more like the two middle cases, right? All right. And we can go into actual numbers here. So this is empirics. Nobody understands. Uh, there's no theory. Well, there probably is theory, but there's no good theory that's accepted <laughs> about why this is true. But we've noticed that it seems a Gini coefficient of about 0.27 is ideal. Now, if you were Marx, you would say, no, 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 zero is ideal, right? Everybody should, everybody should work equally hard and should get the same amount, right? That's the ideal. But it turns out that it's hard to get that working. <laughs> um, you could think that you need a motivation, humans need a gradient to follow, or you could be more economic and say, look, the great innovators need to have access to capital so that they can build their companies. You know, however you want to describe it, it seems like you need some kind of a, a, a gradient. I'm a machine learning person, I'll say gradient. Okay. Um, but if it gets very high, and this is really not that high, right? If it gets a little high, you start getting vandalism, discontent. People say that's not fair. All right. And this is a situation that um, I think a lot of Europe still is, and America was till recently. Um, 
but um, unfortunately, uh, interestingly, uh, France was, so the inequality in the OECD started increasing, um, uh, well, really in 78. And around the early 2000s, France said, wait, 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 no way. And they, they actually have kept it down into the 20s, but they're still having some social disruption. So this is, like I said, one number isn't enough for everything. But um, anyway, when you get over 0.4, you start seeing actually economic decline. Because, you know, if, if people don't have any money, they can't spend it. And, you know, if you just have a very small type of people with a huge amount of money, they just drive up the cost of yachts or something, but it's not actually something that strengthens the economy. Right. And unfortunately, uh, uh, Brazil was recently over 0.6. All right. So, so that, that's the kind of things that can lead to massive social disruption. All right. One of the things that bothers me, though, when people say it was AI that's causing all this inequality, is that it's not the first time we've been in this situation. Okay. So this is a graph by one of, uh, well, one of the guys in this thing, McCart uh, Nolan McCarty is one of the people I'm working with right now. And that's how I started learning about the political economy in general. And then we're trying to con connect that to AI. But it, this is American data because he's an Americanist. I apologize for that. Um, but the darker gray line is the proportion of income. Remember I said that wealth is probably what matters, but income is what we can measure. The proportion of income that the top 1% of, of earners is getting, okay? And so uh, the reason this number starts in 1913 is because that was when America banned alcohol. And so they replaced alcohol tax with income tax. And that's why we have numbers from then, okay? It's kind of a crazy thing, America's weird. But anyway, um, what you can see is we had really high inequality uh, right around the time of World War I, right? And then um, we also had very, very high political polarization. So political polarization here is measured by uh, whether the two parties in America are cooperating on legislation. All right. But, um, but this correlates really well with identity politics and political polarization in the rest of the world. Right. So, so but I'm just using it as a proxy because that's what we had a good measure for. What you see is not only that there was a lot of AI, I mean, there was a lot of inequality well before there was any AI at all, um, but also that there was this period where we got, we brought down the polarization and then we were able to bring down the inequality, all right? And that, basically what happened in America was after the First World War and the uh, crash, the economic crash of 1929, enough of the economic elite were willing to sign up with the interests of the proletariat that you got uh, a massive period of redistribution. So we called it the New Deal. It was uh, uh, Roosevelt, who was also the president during the first part of the Second World War. But you see there are recoveries from before the World Wars started. Um, there's a lot of controversy around this because some people say only war can really change things. Um, but, but I think that you can see that policy can change things. This was also true in the UK. I'm sorry, I don't have the graph to show you. But unfortunately in Europe, there was this war, the First World War, which basically, the, I, if, no offense to people who, whose, whose grandparents fought in it, but it was nuts. <laughs> and, and I think that, that that nuts is probably correlated to this high inequality. But some of the countries, it, sort of a random selection of countries lost. And the ones that lost started having their wealth extracted as reparation to the ones who won. And the ones that lost and had their wealth extracted um, fell into fascism. And so, um, and then we had the Second World War. So some people see that as all one process. So at the end of the Second World War in 1945, um, everybody, the global elite got together in this place called Bretton Woods and they agreed no wealth extraction anywhere. They, they eliminated the banking laws that allowed for uh, uh, transnational wealth extraction, because that is one of the mechanisms by which you get high inequality. Um, unfortunately, by the late 60s, they re-innovated, well, they, actually the city of London was one of the people who started with this. They figured out new ways to extract wealth, right? And even now, the countries with really high inequality tend to be the ones, they aren't necessarily having the wealth extracted themselves, sometimes their own elite are doing this. So unfortunately, like Greece, Greece has done this, Afghanistan is having it extracted, Russia extracts its own wealth, right? And they maintain very high inequality. Um, 
And, you know, it's weird because the leaders think that will lead to uh, stability, at least for the leaders, but it doesn't. When you have a very high curve like this, then, of course, you're precarious. And so, uh, so I think that's, as I said, why we had so much trouble in the early part of the 20th century. Anyway, yeah, so you might say, well, that, that curve is starting in the middle of nowhere. Um, that Schneidel publishes, he's one of the guys that says, oh, you know, war is necessary. But, but this graph... Again, you can see that there was a there was a leveling off before before this big crash in the twenties, um, and this is the just the data on polarization. So we don't have income from before nineteen thirteen, but we can see that there was this building of uh, polarization that was happening in the late nineteenth century, and we also know that in the UK we we have records of people like Churchill saying like what's going on in the late late eighteen nineties it's getting harder to govern. And so in the late in the late 1900s is when people started talking about the welfare state because Marx, right? So what was going on then? I think probably it's every time we figure out a new technology that reduces the cost of distance, then we have new ways for inequality to build up, right? So in the old days, it was um, newspapers, oil, um, because oil is cheaper to move around than coal, um, rail, telegraph, and now we have maybe ICT is what's doing it. Now this is stuff, like I said, we're working on this and we're trying to get it through peer review. But what you can definitely see is that this period, some people are calling 1978 the great decoupling because wages plateaued and they stopped following um, productivity. But the point is, if you look at this graph, that there was a coupling. There was a period which was probably deliberately policy, deliberate policy that made sure that wages did follow productivity and that was how inequality um, and polarization were kept low. So I think we can, again, fix this if we have the political will. Something happened in 78, which I suspect was the plateauing of the Soviet economy. A lot of people have other theories. But that I think something disrupted the, uh, the, the political will to do the redistribution. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying, that's why I do things like this. I'm trying to help people regenerate that political will. So my claim is that governing AI isn't that different from just governing. I already told you that uh, you could basically define humans as, you know, the apes with the AI, right? Language and, and writing and things like this is what made things happen. So I don't think that we should be treating the present moment as completely exceptional. I think we should be learning from history. Um, and I would say that regulating AI is probably very like regulating software in general and that's and like uh, regulating commerce in general. Okay, so let's talk about really basic ideas, transparency in an AI system and accountability for that AI system. Oops, I went a long time on the, uh, <laughs> on the economics, sorry about that. You know, people say oh, we can't possibly uh, regulate AI because we lose the magic juice of the main algorithm that people thought used to think was the magic algorithm, deep learning. Um, and it's still a great algorithm. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that it isn't magic, right? It isn't going to solve all of AI for the reasons I told you before. So in the worst case, AI is as, as inscrutable as humans, right? Nobody goes and says, I need to know the accountant's synapses, right? When they're regulating a bank, right? They, that's not what we worry about. So it doesn't matter that we have no idea what the weights are doing in deep learning. Who cares? All right? We want to audit the equivalent of accounts. And actually, we can do that more easily with AI. Because we can go and we can say, why did you build the software the way you built it? Who changed which line of code at what time? It's just called revision control. I hope you guys all know what revision control is and use it, right? But you could do revision control not just for the code, but for things like the data libraries that you're training off of and for the parameters that you use when you're training your data, right? And then you can log the system's performance. And I can prove all this stuff is perfectly possible because every single time there's been a fatality involving a driverless car, We've had all this information on the front pages of the newspapers within a week, right? Why is that? It's because the automotive industry is really well regulated because it's so deadly, right? And so the fact that AI was inserted was not an excuse. And so all those people that, that know how to build cars also know how to keep these kinds of records, right? So it's perfectly doable. One of the most important things though is that we keep this idea that humans are accountable, right? And a lot of people, they want, they really, really want, partly because we don't want to die, and so we want to believe that AI will be our eternal children. Look, AI is not eternal. Like, that's, that's a math thing. Math is eternal because it's not real, right? It's an abstraction. 
But, but anyway, we're not going to have eternal children. But also, um, the, uh, the, there's, so the, there's like, a, there's like a, a hype thing where you, you talk about, oh, you know, the AI itself might become our children. But then also then, like, oh, the AI is responsible for the mistakes that the car makes or something like that. That isn't going to work because we set up our legal system, in fact, our entire society, even before law, based on dissuasion, right? You don't, you don't do bad things, you know, not because you don't want to get in trouble, basically, right? I mean, that's not the only reason. It's very strongly internalized. Some, lots of people try to do the good things. Um, and and it, we're evolved to do that. We, we can decide to do that because of reputation or our belief or our faith, right? But law is for the people who don't do the good things. Right, a lot of, well, it also helps the people who want to do good things coordinate. I don't want to undermine that. But the point is that we can't dissuade AI the way we dissuade our children or our friends or our enemies, right? It, it doesn't matter that you lock a robot in a prison or that you take away a robot's money. And even if you made a part of a robot that really cared, like you had a timer and a bomb, and like you said, okay, if the robot is alone for five minutes, it's going to blow up. The rest of the robot's intelligence doesn't care, right? It's not like we're, we, we're systemically averse. It's, it's terrible. Isolation is a form of torture, right? It's, it's wrong to, uh, to, well, to leave your dog alone either. either you, know? <laughs> like, you know, isolation is bad for social species. So there's no penalty of law that we can put against an artifact, which includes shell companies, by the way. So, so unfortunately, that's part of the reason why there's a lot of corruption now. Um, it's going to have any efficacy. Oops, sorry about that. I have no idea. There is that. All I was trying to show you was that there's a paper about this, and I don't know why that flashed. So go ahead and read this if you want. There's also more recent papers that uh, summarize it because people find it confusing. Um, let's talk about employment briefly. Uh, I know that I should really finish in the next sort of five minutes so you guys have some questions. But um, Again, empirically, we have more AI now than ever, and we have more jobs now than ever. <laughs> and there's this absolutely brilliant paper by David Autry called Why Are There Still Some More Jobs? And just read it. But um, I worry that something else is going on, that AI may be increasing inequality not only by having the best companies, which is ICT more than AI, but also that um, by making it easier to do things. Okay, so... <clears throat> one of the things that David Autor talks about is that there's actually more human bank tellers now than there were before ATMs, all right? Well, why is that, okay? There's actually fewer humans per branch because now you can, you know, the machines do a bunch of the boring jobs and they do them more quickly. But the humans that are still there are slightly higher paid and, um, and it still comes out that the branches are much cheaper and so then the banks opened a lot more branches, and which is what people wanted. They wanted a branch nearby, okay? So there's actually more human tellers than there were before, but it's not just that, the, that, uh, that there's fewer tellers per branch, but that meant there could be fewer bank managers, branch managers, right? And those guys used to make a lot of money. And so that affects communities, because if you had a couple of people in your community that made a lot of money, that got promoted and suddenly had more money than everybody else, they tended to be the people that like helped out with the schools, you know, helped out with those civic parties and the parades and that kind of thing, right? Those guys are gone, right? There just aren't those guys. Because you don't need as many managers if you have fewer human staff, right? So here's another example. Uh, people say, oh, driverless is going to destroy, you know, all these industries because, you know, driving is really important. And then other people point out, like, wait a minute, there aren't enough drivers right now. You know, you can't hire them and they're like old guys and they don't, and, they, and nobody's replacing them. All right. So, so it's okay that we have driverless. Well, actually what's going on is that we've already made, uh, we've already started making being a truck driver a bad job, even though there's not totally driverless. There's a couple of other things we have. We have, the, the first thing was power steering, all right? And again, if you go back to that definition of intelligence I had way back at the beginning, power steering is translating what you do with the, with the steering wheel into steering the, the truck. Before the 1970s, you didn't have power steering and you had to be a really strong person to be able to drive a big truck because you were physically 
turning the thing that was turning the, the gear, you know, the gear chain to, to make the, the vehicle go. All right. So you had to be a really big guy person, probably it doesn't have to be a guy, but it was often a guy. Um, you had to be able to navigate with a map. You had to be able to organize your time. I mean, it was a, spe- it was a hard job and it got paid a lot. It got paid 50%. Um, we get paid, truck drivers now get paid 50% less than they did in the 1970s. All right. So I would say we're already, um, AI is already affecting the, the driving industry and it has been for decades. And we didn't really have a name for it because we thought, oh, you know, AI isn't here yet because it doesn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> right? but, but we're already sort of replacing a good chunk of what it is to be a driver. And so the job sucks now, actually, in, in some ways. I'm sorry to be rude. <laughs> but, but if you look, you know, taxi drivers, it's, it's a less exciting job because you don't get to innovate about navigation anymore. You have to follow the machine or the customer gets annoyed. So it's just about sort of moving your arms about a bunch and talking to the customer, right? So, um, yeah, I, I, I threw in a couple of slides I don't think I have time for, so I'm going to skip over these. I'm sorry. But the basic idea that I think is the bottom line is it's not stupid to invest in the public good. It is a good idea to be altruistic, but the, how good of an idea that, that is depends on what kind of economy you're in uh, and what kind of payback you can get. Like, for example, what is the rule of law? What is the stability? Are the people who are generous the ones who are likely to get um, uh, good benefits from that generosity? All right. And um, yeah, so I think this is part of why the, we're seeing a fluctuation in uh, um, uh, po- political polarization and the economy that these things go hand in hand. But I don't have time to talk about it right now, but you can find this paper in archive if you want. Okay, so to so the conclusions. Um, should we regulate AI? We ha- Oops, sorry, that should have been a build. I'll just tell you. We already uh, regulate AI, right? Um, all right, I'm gonna be very deeply unprofessional and, and, and fix this right now. Sorry, because it's just easier. There we go. All right, so yeah, uh, all commerce is regulated. The question is really, uh, should we change the laws to better deal with, handle the problems of AI, all right? And I think the most important thing we can do here is make sure that those who build and use AI understand that they're still accountable, right? and to help the regulators understand how they can hold these people to account. I mean, all you have to do as a regulator is go in and say, show me how you knew the system was going to work. Show me the procedure by which you actually vetted your system and made sure everything was fine, right? And and decided it was safe. And if they can't explain that to the regulator, then they have a problem. And if you make that the criteria, then the transparency will come along, right? That it's like, well, we don't, you know, open source is not actually the whole, whole answer, for example, right? It, you, you, uh, because who understands millions of lines of code? So, so open source is neither necessary nor sufficient. The, um, in, uh, in pharmaceuticals, they have 10 times the IP that we have, and yet they still have very, they're very well regulated. So they can show the government they went through the right tests, even though not everybody knows how their, their drugs are made. So, right, we need to be able to demonstrate due diligence. We need to be able to follow decent and DevOps when we build our AI. Um, and I think it's very important, and this is what I tell people, uh, not so much students as, uh, as people in the tech industry, that the idea of figuring out how to govern this stuff and how to make sure enough money is coming back into the, the, the society so that we can have, you know, adequate uh, institutions, you know, decent schools, decent roads, um, you know, safety um, is important. It's in all of our interests to participate in that process. So, um, yeah, thank you for your attention. And these are some of the collaborators that have worked on all this stuff. Okay, thank you for your great talk. Um, I get, I, I open the, there is some, uh, okay, um, if there are any questions from our global lecturer,
I think there are a number of uh, nice uh, issues that uh, were touched by this talk. So maybe you, you, someone of you, want to comment or, or to raise questions? <laughs> there was a lot of issues in that talk. <laughs> there are actually a lot of <laughs> interesting. Uh, is, there a, is there something that um, types? Oh, I know. I have to just do my. I stopped sharing my uh, screen. Maybe I can see what was going on. Okay, while well, people warm up, uh, uh, I actually I am um, I have a question about what you said at the very beginning because you said that everybody is uh, I may have got it wrong, eh? but uh, you said that uh, everybody is uh, worried by the amount of data. For example, uh, uh, the US, in the US, they are worried by the possibility that China has to have huge. Uh, data set uh, of the population as a tool for AI. So you, you said that it's not necessarily so important. Right. Well, obviously we know that machine learning is, uh, uses data to train, but um, if that data is redundant, then it doesn't make your AI any smarter. Of course, it still gives you power over individuals. So, so you have seen, unfortunately, things in, in uh, China where if somebody got texted Happy Eid, they wound up at a re-education camp, uh, Eid being a Muslim holiday. So, so data can help you if what you want to do is know what, you, you know, and people make examples for medical things in the West. That's one of the excuses, like what if you have a rare disease and you need to find the other three people on the planet that have that rare disease? So that, the fact that they have to go to that length to make excuses for why you need data shows that they don't really need data on everyone. Um, so, that, so again, this is like stats 101, but the number of, the amount of data you need to, to establish a regularity is proportional to the amount of variation in the population. So if you know, you know, you don't need to look at that many people to figure out that most people have two legs. You know, it's, 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 uh, it depends on what you're trying to predict. If you're trying to predict one individual's actions, then you certainly need data about that individual. But I mean, one of the threats about AI is that the more you know about people in general, the less, you know, so the better your models are, the less data you need about any one person to predict what they're gonna do. No, I see. So no, this I think is an important point because there is a clear attempt to concentrate uh, to have an edge in AI development, but if you are right, <coughs> so we are uh, in a safer position that we could think. So, meaning well, that I'm all this holding of data may not be finally useful. Well, it depends what you think is safe. <laughs> Again, okay. going back to the European example, um, the, there was a, a, a Dutch uh, political scientist told me that, actually it might be a computer scientist, anyway, somebody Dutch told me, that um, almost every uh, Jewish person in the Netherlands was killed in World War II. And, and whereas in Belgium, quite a lot of them were saved. And the reason is just that the Belgians were more disorganized, right? So the Dutch had exactly what everybody's religion was. Yeah, actually, actually and, Belgium and provided a huge differentiation in terms of Yeah, history. so, so whether you think that, that it's, you're safer with more, yeah, I don't know. But the point is, in, in terms of uh, quality of the outcome, what you, the quality of the data matters. And that was one of the things when I was in uh, uh, Tianjin uh, this summer, people were worried about why is it that the American data quality is very high. And it may be because the American data is gathered by companies, not by governments. Again, government, the process of, of gathering by a government, um, the power structure situation is different. And so that may just make it harder. Um, but the, and they were saying that the American data was better than the, Ameri the European data. Well, and one of the interesting things in Europe, of course, is that uh, the GDPR is about uh, defending. Uh, so governments have decided that, or well, the, the EU has decided that, uh, well, first of all, a government is about defending its citizens. One of its main things is defending its citizens and that the data about a person is a part of that person. So now it's the government's job to defend the citizens from being uh, predicted and manipulated. And so that's a really interesting perspective. Uh, and we'll see if that makes uh, the European economy more robust or not. Obviously, it's quite different from uh, both the American and the Chinese perspective. Um, so uh, we'll see. Uh, 
I, 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 I do worry that um, if people don't have something defending their capacity to be different from each other, they become more similar, and then you have a more fragile population. So uh, I think we need room to experiment. Um, and I think that's a very, you know, in fact, there, there's a theoretical biology of that, that, that without variation, uh, you can't change. But with too much variation, you lose, you, you lose the good tricks. Right, and and so the that's the good tricks is a done it term, uh, but but uh, you need you, you don't just want entropy either. Entropy is the opposite of order, and you, and you can't sustain a lot of life. You don't have a lot of public goods with complete entropy, so it's somewhere in between, and and coming up with the right way to do that is hard. But anyway, AI, like I said, AI is a part of governance. It's just suddenly we have a lot more information about each other, and so the first thing we do is start trying to control each other more but we may need to pull back and figure out what the right level of balance is. No, very interesting. Sorry, I think I digressed a lot. <laughs> no, no, it was very interesting. No, uh, thank you. I don't know if uh, we have some uh, comment from our uh, lecture global oh, there lecture. is a chat. No, I can see that there's some five chats. I just saw, just a second. Where does it come up? Oh, okay, none of it, none of it's some questions. You guys, if you type questions, I can now see them there. <laughs> no, because actually I have many, but I don't want to uh, germanize. <laughs> where, where are you, Fabio? Where, where are you physically? Uh, actually, I'm in Pisa, I'm in Pisa. You know, I was just in Pisa for the first time. It's a great city. You should invite me. Next time you should do it live. Uh, yes, I'm far from the tower, from the leading tower, so. No, but the, um, I'll be, I'll also be in Vienna next week. I don't know if you're doing that again, speaking of the EU and AI, there's a meeting in, in, in Vienna. No, because I think that this uh, issue about data, you know, it's very, um, it's very debated because for example, uh, and this may also give uh, an excuse for uh, national fire firewalls, right? Because uh, we, an excuse, uh, at least, uh, because uh, um, most of the data are actually concentrated uh, in uh, U.S. companies. So it, I think uh, sometimes I think, for, for example, I'm not particularly fond of GDPR in Europe uh, because I, I also think it was a kind of... Um, a way to, to create problems to Amazon and Google. So it was also, there was a kind of a hidden uh, strategy where it was, well, okay, let's just create some problem to them yeah. and then we well, try the to organize. The EU has been getting some criticism for that. And as I said, we will see what works out. But um, other countries have said, we want the same rights as Europe has. And they are worried about manipulation because they are seeing what's happening with democracies. I'm, I'm worried, I'm wondering what happened with Venezuela. Was that? No, because, uh, you know, we had the famous, uh, but, well, maybe we are going too much into politics, but uh, you, we know the story of the Cambridge Analytica, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems but, that if but, you have uh, a privileged access to data, you can manipulate people yeah, yeah. more easily than okay, before. Okay, I think know about that. But anyway, the EU was getting a uh, hassle saying, oh, but you're going to lose the magic juice again, another way to lose the magic juice. First of all, the European economy is doing extremely well. People keep talking about the, the dollar zone and the, you know, the Chinese and the American economy, but the, the Eurozone economy is, is also one of the top uh, three leading economies. And it's hard to know for sure how they're rented, but it certainly seems like it's been the number one economy in the world at some points, like directly after the crash uh, in 2008. So um, in fact, directly before as well. Um, so, so they're doing something right. Um, and uh, after they put the GDPR through, within six months, they created a new standard for sharing data that was not personal. So there's actually more people in Europe than there are in America. And if you have a good way to share all the non-personal data across the entire union, then you do have like a phenomenal data uh, set. And they are now looking at processing. Um, and also, it may be wrong to think about Google and Facebook and Amazon as uh, American companies. Yes, they were innovated in America, but they're not paying much tax there either. <laughs> and yeah. um, they have become global assets. And that's, I think we may have to do some serious, serious innovation about global governance, about how we're going to handle them. 
because it's not clear that what we want is for America to be able to control them better, right? Because that's not clearly the best thing for the world. Um, so I think the, uh, and it's also not fair, you know, a lot of the, if, if there's more data coming from Europe because there's more people in Europe and they act pretty much like North Americans, then why should more, more of the tax wealth go to America than to Europe, right? And, and the same is true for the rest of the world too. I'm not, I don't want to denigrate the rest of the world. Um, but so, so, but we're all in this together in that sense. Even America's kind of in this because they don't know what they're doing <laughs> with, with respect to regulating their own companies. Um, but but, but uh, there's, uh, yeah. So anyway, about the, back to the, the data thing, I think, I think uh, there are some arguments about that for sure. And, and, uh, and I hope that there'll be uh, an opportunity to see what the benefit, the costs and benefits are um, of, of different strategies. It may be that we're creating an infrastructure such that there can't be that much variation, but I hope that we're gonna maintain the variation and, and, get, to, and get to better understand this. Oh, okay. Since it seems that we don't have it, just uh, I think uh, that uh, Joanna will be happy to answer to any uh, email uh, question that we I'm may so happy to email. I really uh, like answer to many. <laughs> <laughs> to some, she, she will be happy to answer to some question. Maybe you can uh, send to me and uh, yeah, you can yeah. do some filter. Or... But like, I, I don't know if you heard this, but, but ask me questions on Twitter. <laughs> Uh, short questions are good. <laughs> because uh, uh, last uh, question is really. It's an easy question. I'll answer it. Yeah. Are you aware of any? Because I think that, like with taxation, uh, with data, and with uh, the problem is that we have global companies in any in any area, uh, but we have national states. Maybe some big national states. There is some uh, strange. Uh, proto-state like the European Union, uh, but we don't have a global governance. Have, are you aware of any attempt at global level to have a governance? Yeah, absolutely. And they are. So we do sort of, we don't have, so what is governance? Part of what governance is is redistribution. And we don't have a lot of power at this level, but the UN does have an internet governance forum. And it's really interesting what they do. And like the EU, um, the EU doesn't really have power, and I mean, it happens it has a lot of power, but in other ways it doesn't have direct, you know, taxation powers and, and military mm -hmm. power. Um, so I think that uh, what's going to happen is that you have to have sort of these coordinated power systems uh, where, where I think the EU is a great model. They come up with a set of treaties and then the nation states enact the treaties. And I think that's sort of what we're seeing, like, for example, the GDPR, the, the EU said, Okay, tech giants, if you want European data and money, you have, to, you have to conform to these rules. And the tech giants are saying, oh, okay. And actually for them, it's a little easier than some of the smaller companies that, that for which you know, complying with the GDPR was a real cost because uh, they just didn't have as much money. Whereas you know, if you're Apple or Google, you have more money than you can legally spend you know, because of monopoly laws. So they could, they could conform to that. And then other countries say, hey, we want, we want in on that too. And now that they've already set it up, they could say, okay, it's not that expensive to add other countries into this, this sort of uh, service. So I think what we need to be doing is basically negotiating with the big tech, almost like it's a company, a country, I mean, like in, in uh, governance forums. And so the, the, like I said, the Internet Governance Forum is a UN thing. They do meet like a couple times a year and, and it's amazing. I went once on behalf of the OECD. The OECD itself uh, is expanding and it's coming up, with, it's gonna have a set of, re of, of recommendations, I think within the next couple of months. They've been working on it for a couple of years and they're kind of in their end game now. The EU has this, they're not in their end game, they're always a bit slow, but they do again have this big panel that are trying to come up with a set of recommendations. So you can say there's too many recommendations and I think you're right, that there, there could be an over diversification of everybody having their own little rules or whatever. But when it's something like the EU or the UN, then it can get consolidated into treaty or the, or the, or the OECD. Um, you know, a lot of the EU's uh, data regulation was derived from the OECD recommendations in the 70s. They had a lot of foresight. So it's all possible. Okay, so thank you. I, I thank you for uh, your, your very interesting and inspiring talk. I, I, suppose I could uh, 
Sorry, everybody. I could actually continue to ask questions for the next couple of hours. <laughs> but we're so it's very time that we, <laughs> it's very time that we stop. So <laughs> thank you again, everybody, for attending. Uh, thank you, Joanna, for uh, for your talk and uh, for uh, the global lecture hall. See you in two weeks. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Joanna, again. Sure.